We're standing in front of the Merchant's House in New York City. This house was built in 1832 and was continuously occupied by the same family from 1835 to 1933. After that, it was turned into a museum. So what we have here is a rather unique example of a house as it would have been lived in in 1855 or so when it was last completely renovated. Sarah Gordon, historian and former docent in the house, is going to take us through the house so that we can look and see what the people who lived in it actually did. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Alice. We're interested in learning something about how people lived inside this house and especially how the women of the house lived. The Merchant's House is a unique place, not only because it was lived in by one family for a hundred years and contains many of their belongings, but because it offers us a way to understand the work done by the women in that house. This is the front parlor of the Merchant's House. In 1855, there were 10 family members living in the house and four Irish servants. Seabury Treadwell was an affluent merchant and they were members of the middle class and were very much a part of a intricate social world dedicated to maintaining that social class. That was Mrs. Treadwell's job. She entertained and educated her children in a way that would establish their social status. Part of that was ceremonial calling in which the ladies of the neighborhood would visit each other on a rotating basis. A visitor would come up the front steps and be let into the vestibule. She could leave a calling card at that point and leave, or the servant could let her into the hallway, at which point the servant would find out from Mrs. Treadwell if she was in fact receiving. Mrs. Treadwell might be in the back parlor or upstairs. If she was receiving, the visitor would be let into this room and perhaps sit over in one of these chairs. She would then wait for several minutes while Mrs. Treadwell came and would use that time to admire the surroundings. This is quite a opulent room and was redecorated in 1855 in the latest fashion. New gas was put in, lovely lamps, beautiful furniture, new carpet, and the room was overall quite impressive, including a pianoforte which represented that the daughters of the house were taught to be refined young ladies. Also, this room was cleaned first thing in the morning before the family was even up. The servants would come here before dawn, make sure everything was clean, and would take some of the lights downstairs to clean later in the day. The room would have to be all ready for that day's callers. Now we're entering the rear parlor. The rear parlor could be used as a private family space, but was also part of the social world of the family. The dining table could expand to accommodate 14 people, and dinner parties were a big part of the social world of the family. They involved copious amounts of food, fancy linens and silver and china, and were definitely a way of showcasing the family's wealth. The servants had a very important role in this, of course. The cook would be making all the food. The servants would serve and prepare everything. The dinner party is a perfect example of how this kind of lifestyle was absolutely dependent on the servants' work. The parlors are very much the public part of the house. Now we're going to go to a much more private part of the house, downstairs in the family dining room. This is the family dining room. It was a comfortable space year-round. It was warm in the winter and cooler in the summer. And the family spent much of their time here eating, but also reading, playing, sewing, visiting with intimate friends. It's also a room that was very important for Mrs. Treadwell. Part of her job was to raise her children. This was very important in this time. And the idea of middle-class children being raised to be good citizens and good mothers was central to her role in the family. Here she would teach her children to read and write before they went to school. She would also give them religious instruction and she was socializing them for their entree later into middle class life. This room was also the center of Mrs. Treadwell's work as supervisor of the servants. Her job was to hire, train, and supervise the servants and in this household there were four. 
a cook, who was the most experienced, the cook's helper, a housemaid, and a second girl who would help the housemaid. There was also sometimes a nanny. By the time the family is gathering in this room for breakfast, the servants have already been up for hours working in the kitchen. This is the kitchen. In a way, we can think of it as the heart of the home in that it was from where the food, hot water, clean clothes, and workers would circulate throughout the house. The cook was the most experienced member of the servants, and she had quite a job to do. She had to provide three meals a day for 14 people every day. The marketing was done up on 8th Street at Tompkins Market, and would be brought back here to be prepared. The stove was very important at this time. The house was built with an open hearth, and the servants coming from Ireland would have been familiar with that sort of cooking in which you could hang a pot on a brace or have a pot with legs, sometimes called a spider. But when they came to putting in cast iron stoves, you could make more food and more varieties of food at once, which led to the large dinner parties. This stove worked by having coal in the center and had two ovens and you could regulate the heat of the burners by having coals underneath them as well. The servants had to learn how to do this. They also had to learn how to regulate the temperature and once a week would clean it all out and black it with a kind of stove polish to keep it from rusting. You also see a different kind of cooking technology called a beehive oven. This was used for making bread and other baked goods. Making bread took about five hours from start to finish, and they would do that about twice a week. The extra bread would be stored in a pie safe, which was over here used for baked goods and other food leftovers, for example, that you wanted to keep safe from bugs, mice, things like that. It had perforated tin so that air could circulate, but the bugs couldn't get in. The kitchen is also the location where the servants, the housemaid and her helper, would do all the lamp cleaning. Quite a job every day to maintain all the dirty lamps so the family had clean lamps by the evening. You'll also see the call bells. This would be the center of the servants' world, and the family members could ring the bells with a little switch in each room. The bells had a different tone so that the servants would know who was calling, and they would probably know why. So in the morning, they would know that Eliza Treadwell wanted hot water, for example. And hot water was a big deal in this house. You would have to cook it on the stove, carry it up all those flights to the bedrooms. On top of all the cooking, the cook and her helper were responsible for laundry, which is a massive job. Every Monday, that was the universal wash day, they would take all the family's personal clothes, the linens were probably sent out, and they would have to bring them downstairs, soak them, scrub them, boil them, rinse, use bluing for light-colored things, which would make it a brighter white, rinse it out all again, and then in the summer, they could hang it out outside in the garden, but in the winter, they would have to carry the damp clothes all the way up to the top floor in the attic where they would dry it. The next day, it all had to be ironed with flat irons that they would heat on the stove. And you'd have to have a rotating number of them. You would heat one or two while you used another. So on wash days, the family often had a cold dinner. The woman of the house had many jobs. Her bedroom, this is Eliza Treadwell's bedroom. Her bedroom served as a place where she could perform a number of those jobs. For one thing, this family, they were Episcopalian. She was essentially the spiritual guide of the family, and that was very much part of her role as a wife and mother. Eliza Treadwell would also have kept a number of accounts for the family. She was responsible for the servants' wages, for example, and so she would have kept her own accounts in her room. And she was also responsible for writing a lot of letters to friends and family as part of maintaining the social networks and social status of the family. Eliza Treadwell's bedroom is a feminine multipurpose space. And this is Seabury Treadwell's bedroom. As the mannequin behind me illustrates, people of the merchant class did not go to hospitals when they were ill. 
Instead, the woman of the house was to nurse family members. Hospitals were for poor people, and doctors came to the homes of the wealthier. One of the jobs performed by the servants day in and day out was lighting fires. The fireplaces burned coal. Every morning, for example, the kitchen maid would come upstairs while the family was at breakfast, and she would lay out a cloth in front of the fireplace, pull out all the old cinders and ashes from the previous day, set up charcoal and coal in the fireplace, add kerosene to light it and light it with a striking match. Then she would put something called a blower on top of it. It didn't in fact blow, but it created a draft so it would ignite better. This was repeated several times a day, depending on which room and how much it was being used in what season. These are the servants' quarters at the very top of the merchant's house. The women who lived here in 1855 were Bridget Murphy, Anne Clark, Mary James, and Mary Smith. They would have been hired by Mrs. Treadwell, and the terms of their employment would have been negotiated but they probably included Sunday off and Thursday afternoon or evening off. Their Catholicism was a source of tension with their employers. Many employers were concerned, for example, the servants would teach their children the rosary or other Catholic beliefs, and there was a great deal of tension about that, especially with nursemaids. Each servant would have their own bed, metal to prevent bed bugs, and they did have a stove in the 1850s. They would have had a wash basin, but to, to use it, they would have had to carry the water all the way up four flights of stairs from the kitchen and then carry it back down again. Their bedrooms would have been a semi-private space, and yet they were always on call. But it was a space where they could write letters, read letters, say the rosary, talk to the other servants about their memories of Ireland, where they could have that shared experience. These rooms may seem spare compared to the opulent rooms downstairs, but in comparison to a tenement in the Lower East Side or in Five Points, it's airy, it's spacious, there's natural light, they had a stove. So in terms of accommodation for the working class at this time, this is a pretty nice room. Eliza Treadwell and her daughters were working hard to maintain their status as part of the merchant class. And the Irish servants who they employed worked very hard to support that lifestyle. Altogether, it allows us a way to see how different sides of work were performed in one space by different people with different experiences.